Today is another teardown. This one is a pretty long time in the making. It took almost a year, but finally today the IKEA adapters are having their day. It's going to be pretty hands-off on the teardown though, just looking at the components and identifying some of the decisions that were made and asking questions of the audience what they think of the various choices made in these devices. I will look at and identify the major components of these power supplies. In the teardown series, I like to open up electronics to find out what makes them work and what is inside. The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The components will be identified and analyzed, as well as some of the safety aspects. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Special thanks to my patrons and channel supporters for making this possible. Links in the description. So before I get too into the teardown, I wanted to go over the specifications of these adapters. The 30 watt adapter is a more basic device, but offers basically as many modes as it can for a 30 watt adapter. Being 30 watts, there are some limits of course, but I'm happy with what this can do. The main issue with this adapter is compared with its cousin, it was a lot more AC leaky, and we'll have to check that out. In terms of the performance, this one isn't the best thing out there, but for a 30 watt adapter, especially at this price point, it's at least average in terms of other adapter performance. The ripple voltage, general voltage stability, both look good. The efficiency could be a little better in the mid-range output of the device, but it gets to 90% at the high end. The very light duty efficiency is also very good. Switching over to the 45 watt adapter, this adapter adds a second USB-C port, so this is subject to power renegotiation if you use two ports. The full review linked in down below goes over this. This can do two PPS ports at once though, so that's not bad. We will see some interesting things inside of this adapter as to why it has this split. So when we look at the overall data for this device, the voltage is stable. There is an interesting result in the ripple, and there is a reason for that. Again, this is a teardown video and we will find out why. The efficiency is very good though. At this watt class, this is a very good performer. There is no power factor correction, so the power quality score is, as expected, very low. This is common across all power adapters at this power level. So this, again, is right in line with everything on the market. There are research projects, but I doubt they'll see the light of day. There just isn't the money or supply chain to do anything different. And prying these things apart with the appropriate tools, smash and crack, they actually came apart okay. There are some immediate things to notice about these adapters. Starting with the 30 watt adapter, it has a shield around the transformer, and yet it has a suppression capacitor. So there must have been some kind of EMI issue with this device, and they really had to go out in this thing to be able to get it in compliance. This adapter is a single USB power adapter, and after that note on the shield, there isn't much to note on this device. I'll go over the details of each part shortly. The 45 watt adapter was a bit different once I popped it open. The inside is covered in a big aluminum shield. This is a heatsink. This is different. I am assuming this will take over from the transformer shield we saw on the other one. Actually, that's probably a heatsink too. And once the adapter's guts are slid out of this casing, yep, no extra shield on this transformer. Wait a second, there's two transformers. Ah, uh, one of these. I've torn down like this before, more than one. It's two 22.5 watt adapters in one case. This is why we saw the ripple voltage shift in the middle of the power range. This is the power level that combined the output of the two adapters, causing a reduction in the voltage ripple on the output rail. There are extra MOSFETs on the USB outputs that can facilitate this power sharing. One thing I like on both of these adapters is the way the AC pins connect to the circuit board. These are solid pins that slot into the circuit board. This means there are no wires to get pinched, potentially causing shorts or failures on adapter. This was a finding on more than a few teardowns I've done as well, so good to see this connection method inside of the IKEA adapters. Okay, this part of the video is kinda gonna be a slideshow since it's easier to go over these one piece at a time. So first up is this 30 watt adapter. What is everything and what does it do? Well, I'm gonna go out of order. First, I'm gonna spend some time looking at the transformer on this. This component is very important part of this device. This being a flyback converter, there is a gapped transformer. That being, it stores magnetic energy because the energy transfers on alternate cycles of the switching. First charge, then discharge of the magnetic storage. This transformer is built well. It has a shield tied to one of the primary legs. No complete winding here as that would create a short circuit. Inside, that is the auxiliary winding. This supplies the power to keep the adapter working. Under that is the first half of the primary winding, well separated with tape and insulated wire. 
two parallel wires in this case. Under that is the fully double insulated primary winding. This is really great stuff. Multiple layers of tape, two layers of insulation on the wire. The wires never contact each other directly. Under that is the final primary winding. Overall, an excellent transformer. I'm not gonna look at the 45 watt transformer here. They are also excellent though. Okay, time to look at the components on the circuit board. First, looking at the top side of the board, we have the input filter capacitors and an inductor. These are used to smooth out the rectified AC mains and turn it into a DC voltage so the power converter can then use it to turn into something your device can charge from. Yeah, it does AC to DC to chop DC to smooth DC with a big voltage divider. Here, we get another look at that shielded transformer, installed this time. See previous section for the description of this. Next up is the output filter capacitor, which looks to be a polymer type, the USB-C port, and the synchronous rectifier chip. This is a more efficient way of converting the AC, or chop DC, from the output of the transformer back into DC your device uses. The metal over the transformer is actually a heatsink for the power MOSFET, which is hidden here. I was not able to get a part number off of it. And looking closer at the AC input side, there are several protection components on the circuit board, more than some other adapters. There is a MOV or metal oxide varistor, and this component can help protect against transient events. There is also an X-class capacitor, which is part of the EMI filter, along with the common mode choke. These aren't necessary for operation, but are very necessary so this thing doesn't turn your household wiring into a big antenna. There is also a fuse. Another component on the circuit board is the negative temperature coefficient resistor. The purpose for this component is to help with inrush current. Once in operation, the component heats up and becomes a lower resistance. But when you initially plug it in cold, it will have a higher resistance, limiting inrush current. Neat. This is the spark you get sometimes when you plug in a power adapter. In looking at the bottom of the board, we can find an optic coupler for sending the power supply instructions from the low voltage side to the high voltage side. Hey, I need more voltage. Hey, I need less voltage. More or less. Of course, here we also find the full bridge rectifier. This converts the incoming AC power into a DC pulsed power at twice the line frequency. I couldn't find anything on the control chip or the power MOSFET for this device. One thing that is good on this side of the device is the auxiliary capacitor can be found here made from several ceramic capacitors. No drying capacitors here. They may still crack, but that's a different problem. Finally, one of the things is in testing of this device, it was a little higher in leakage current. It looks like this device uses a 2.2 nanofarad suppression capacitor, and this seems to be the only source of connection, so this component is probably on the high side of the tolerance. Finally, looking at the USB negotiation chip, this is a SW2303 chip. You can find the datasheet online for this one. There's also a MOSFET for the USB output hiding in there. We'll see that better in the next device. Okay, there is going to be a lot of shared components between the 30 and 45 watt, but time to dive into the 45 watt adapter. The first thing to notice in this adapter is that it has two transformers. These work together to supply the power to the output, either independently or together to make one port. The AC input pins are again are highlighted here and show the posts that would connect onto the wall socket. This PCB also has a separate PCB for dealing with the USB side. Let's take a closer look at that. Here is the USB control chipset, and again, the datasheet is available online for this one. The big thing to note here is that this has a bunch of extra MOSFETs. These are what enable this charger to be able to share power between the two physical adapters and or keep them separate. I've seen this before. Next, identifying some of the top side components. These are really the same and the same function as the 30 watt version. There is one notable exception. This adapter uses an electrolytic auxiliary capacitor, so that may be a point of failure. I'm just looking for something. This is the standard way it is done and it's not wrong. Okay, finally, bottom side of the circuit board. What are these things? We find a one nanofarad capacitor. A lower value means less leakage, so that's the difference between these two adapters. The full bridge rectifier and synchronous rectifier are also found here, but the big one is the all-in-one chip that does basically everything. Pretty neat. Again, the data sheet for this one can be found online. Here's a little snippet from the first page. This is a 22 watt power adapter chip. No surprises at all to find two of them in here. These adapters are of very high quality in terms of the attention paid to meeting safety requirements and building the adapters to meet standards of safety, EMI, and isolation. For the price point, these are competing at the bottom of the market with many adapters that don't even try to match the level of quality in these adapters. 
in those terms. I wonder if Ikea is selling these at cost or at a small loss because they sell a lot of other stuff. The adapters do suffer a little from cheap component selection, but really not bad. Notably, the capacitors on the 45 watt device, as with pretty much every other USB adapter that exists, there are cheap capacitors in parts of the circuit that will go away with heavy use, but it is less of an issue with a smaller adapter like this because it won't get as hot. The main input capacitance should be fine, the output capacitors should be fine, but the auxiliary capacitor wedged in the middle of a hot box is more susceptible to that shorter life and could make the device fail. But interestingly, the 30 watt adapter does something rare and very welcome. It uses a ceramic capacitor for the auxiliary cap. If you want to know more about this, there's a capacitor analysis section in the review linked in various places, description most likely. That says why this is a good idea. I really should just upload that as a separate little video section. In the 45 watt adapter, it is really a minor issue. At this, it is a lower powered device, so it won't get as hot overall, but being the lowest capacitance, these will dry out first, and without this capacitor, the whole adapter doesn't work. It's always the capacitors, except that 30 watt, which, nice. Merch, coming soon maybe. So other than that minor concern, these are genuinely, at this price point, some of the best adapters I've seen. Good quality construction, good components, and not much to complain about. They are still available, the price is still low, so if you just need a basic phone charger and maybe a little extra for some devices, these are not bad adapters. They have the requisite components to meet the safety requirements and in general perform at least average compared with the industry. And they don't charge a premium for their performance. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Goodbye.